Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome. And to those joining us uh, outside of the sanctuary uh, in their living rooms or wherever you're watching this, uh, we're glad to have you with us today. Uh, announcements. Uh, we want to mention we're having communion this morning, so if you're watching at home, uh, get yourself uh, uh, some bread or crackers and uh, something to drink, and you can share in the uh, sacrament of communion with us on this, the first Sunday of Lent. I also want to uh, remind folks there's an um, uh, adult education class. Uh, it was very interesting last time. We had so much fun, we delayed the start of the next one until 10.30, uh, but we're still doing an hour and a half on the Psalms, and we're using a book by Walter Brueggemann. I see uh, Craig. Did I see Craig come in? Yes. Craig. Oh. <laughs> so, Craig, with the, um, are we supposed to get new books now? Uh, yes. <laughs> we didn't like the first version, so we're getting a second version of the same book, right? Uh, no. Uh, it's a different book. Okay. <laughs> it's on the way. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, and we'll meet on we'll meet it on Wednesday at um, ten thirty. But if you don't have the book, you're excused from the homework for the week. So you're some advantage to that, I guess. Okay. Uh, are there other announcements we should be making? Yes, Lynn. It comes with a show and tell. Um, Laura got a little excited over vacation. Why, thank you. And uh, she made some little homemade potpourris here, and they don't have, I mean, we've got like 30 of these at home, really, seriously, she just went to town. So it's like some, uh, some pine, some cinnamon, some orange, some cranberry, some bay leaves, and it smells really good simmering on a low simmer on your pot on the stove or the wood stove or something like that. So I'll leave them by the door, and if you're interested, take one, take two, take a bunch. But <laughs> just in case anybody would like something to make it smell nice in their home, you're welcome to one. Thank you very much. That's very nice. We might get one of those because we think there's a dead mouse somewhere in the living room. We don't know why, so. <laughs> I didn't make that up, by the way. We are. Uh, okay, other and oh, candy. Um, okay. Um, I think we all have been following the national news with heavy hearts, and um, I've not made enough, but I these little ribbons and I will make more um, but the first one goes to Richard Backus <laughs> we keep running into town it, Rich Dick and I wearing yellow and blue so anyway they'll be out in the hall and uh, you know pray for our friends Thanks. Thank you. It's on. I promised the Girl Scouts across the street, because some of them are our Sunday school friends, um, that if you are interested in purchasing any Girl Scout cookies, um, that they are on the porch at Dodge's today until 3, and they still have quite the good selection. If you've been out and about and might have noticed that some of the troops that are out there might be running low on some specific certain favorite flavors, but they have all the flavors as far as I knew five minutes ago, so uh, they would love some patronage. Thank you. Thank you. Girl Scout cookies, okay. And uh, I should probably just mention, we inserted, and for people at home, I guess you don't see this, but we'll uh, try to get the information out, uh, uh, an insert in the bulletins from the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance uh, foundation about how we can help uh, our friends in the Ukraine. So uh, I'll be talking about that a little bit too in the sermon. But um, uh, the information's here, and if you want to make a gift, you can do it that way. If you uh, don't do it electronically and you want to do it in the church, if you make out the uh, checks, 
uh, to the uh, Presbyterian Church USA, and you put it in the offering plate, just so we uh, uh, separate those, and we'll mail any ones we get here, but then other people can email them or text them or whatever you do these days to pay bills. But um, um, we want to be uh, help to those who are in the midst of the chaos. Okay, any birthdays or anniversaries? Hey, Woody. Yes, yeah, Paul. I knew of one, Louise. No. Not today? No. Never mind. <laughs> that birthday is canceled officially. I'm sorry. <laughs> Are there other announcements? Elder birthdays? Okay, well, let us begin the uh, worship service with our morning prelude. My sister and um, my um, kid's father, um, so it's Eric and Tessa, is their birthday. So, if we could, yeah. <laughs> time for the morning problem. gathered to worship the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus the Christ, and who calls upon us in this time and place to stand in the gap, to give, to act, and to pray. And let us begin our worship with our first hymn, which is number 415.
reading is a familiar one. It is from uh, the second chapter of the prophet Isaiah, the beginning with the second verse, and let us read together. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established as the highest of the mountains. It will be exalted above the hills, and all nations will stream to it. Many peoples will come and say, come, Let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the temple of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between the nations and will settle disputes for many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. As our affirmation of faith this morning, read together the words from the Confession of 1967 on the announcement side of your bulletins. In Jesus Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. We confess that Jesus Christ is God with us, the eternal Son of the Father, who became human and lived among us to fulfill the work of reconciliation. We believe that the risen Christ is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue and complete his mission. This work of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the foundation of all we say about God, ourselves, and the world.
Scripture reading is from the 25th chapter of Matthew. It is beginning with the 14th verse. Jesus said this, told this story. For it will be as when a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his property. To one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each one according to his ability. Then he went away. He who had received the five talents went at once and traded them, and he made five talents more. So too, he who had the two talents made two talents more. But he who had received the one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time, the master of those servants came and settled accounts with them. And he who had received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you did delivered to me five talents, here I have made five talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And he also, who had the two talents, came forward, saying, Master, you delivered to me two talents. Here I have made two talents more. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. He also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you'd be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not winnow. So I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the ground. But here you have what is yours. But his master answered him, You wicked and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sowed and gather where I have not winnowed? Then you ought to have invested my money with the bankers, and at my coming I should have received what was my own with interest. So take the talent from him and give it to him who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who has not, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the worthless servant into the outer darkness where men will weep and gnash their teeth. And here ends our reading. Children's sermon, I just uh, want to speak. Children's sermon are always for everyone, but um, I think... We've all gone through a difficult time this week, and if we think we have it tough, imagine the people in the Ukraine. And boys and girls watching, if you watch the news with your parents or read the newspaper or go online and look at what's going on uh, in the world, it's pretty horrible, pretty horrible, as the Russians have invaded the Ukraine and a lot of people are suffering. And it seems to me... that kids could show us the way. 
how not to have this atrocity going on. Now, I don't know if kids still do this, but when, when I was a kid, which was just after Lincoln was assassinated, um, <laughs> we recovered from that, but, um, uh, but we would, uh, it didn't matter how many of us there were, if we had 10 people or if we had four people, uh, we would play sports, whatever the season was. In the spring and the summer, we'd play baseball. And starting in the fall, we'd play touch football. Uh, in the winter, when it wasn't too cold, and uh, a friend of ours had a, a garage with a basket on, we'd play a basketball. Once we shoveled the snow out of the way, if there was any. Um, <clears throat> and sometimes we would disagree about, we didn't have any referees there, there were no coaches, it was just a pickup game. And we might uh, disagree about whether somebody was out at first base or not in baseball. Or in football, we played touch football because we're in the street. You don't want to tackle anyone in the middle of a concrete street. Um, uh, we would argue about whether you actually touched the person. You had to use two, it was two-hand touch. So you had to get them with both hands or not. My friend Bronco Panzini was the fastest runner I've ever seen wearing leather-soled shoes. He was very good in the street. So a lot of times there was a question about whether you actually managed to tag him or whether he ran by you uh, for a touchdown. Uh, and then uh, in basketball, you might take a shot. There was no question whether it went in the basket. The question was, were you fouled or not? No referee there to blow a whistle. So did we uh, never speak to each other again or did we get into fist fights? No. <laughs> we, were all, we were all getting along fine. We might argue about what happened. But then we'd say, well, let's just do it over. Let's do it over. Kids, I don't know if you still do that or not, but you could teach us adults um, that rule. And it doesn't matter whether the adult is Bronco Panzini or Woody Woodland playing touch football out on Maxwell Road in Garden City, New York, and disagreeing, or whether it's um, Prime Minister, is that his title over there, uh, Putin, uh, and the head of the Ukraine, and the head of the Ukraine, by the way, the president, uh, is a former comedian. It'd be like electing Stephen Colbert or somebody to be president. He's Zelensky, I believe his name is. He seems to be a really admirable gentleman. We adults can learn from at least those old-time things that kids did, and maybe they still do them. Uh, just have a do-over. There's no, there's no need to punch anybody. There's no need to shoot anybody. There's no need to bomb anybody. Um, talk and come up with a peaceful way to settle arguments. Um, the human race hasn't done very well in that uh, regard all through its history. Maybe it's time uh, that we learned. Well, and I think kids can show us the way. Okay, uh, before we start the sermon, why don't you say good morning or wave or Bump fists or whatever with folks around you. <clears throat> Sometime maybe we could we could do the wave, you know. Might not be able to do it at ballparks for some time, I don't know, so we might have to do the wave. Well, Isaiah's vision has been a vision that has, I don't want to say shaped or try, for the results you wouldn't say this, but has really been an inspiration to me all through uh, the many, many, many years I've been privileged to be an ordained minister. It's a great vision of peace, and Isaiah said this day would come, and um, I've always believed that, but it might not be coming anytime soon from what we see in the world uh, all through the days of my ministry. Um, that scripture reading um, from Isaiah was uh, the uh, first one I ever gave in, in my preaching class at Andover Newton. Um, uh, it was the first sermon I, um, I delivered uh, when I went out to... Um, Meadville, Pennsylvania, where I was, uh, when I was first ordained in 1971, and it's the, um, it was a sermon I submitted on that same scripture reading. I have to submit a sermon 
as part of the ordination process uh, to get approved by the presbytery to be ordained. That was the, that was the scripture reading I submitted a sermon about. Um, now, uh, all these things um, that I just mentioned occurred in the midst of war. I mean, it was the Vietnam War. Um, and then I got out to Meadville. I was ordained um, before going out there in the summer of 1971. As their year, as show how long ago this was, I was the youth minister, um, not much older than the kids in my youth group out there. And um, I was ordained, and then a, one year later, 1972, I was almost fired. This is true. There were three ministers at this big church in Meadville and a full time uh, uh, music person. Although we never called her a minister of music, we could have. She was a wonderful lady just as Sam is our minister of music, and her name was Becky Borthwick. She was just a great lady. So anyway, I got out. Why was I almost fired? Here's why. Um, I went, uh, Barbie went with me. Um, she was a culprit in crime here, although we didn't, <laughs> we didn't know we were going to do anything controversial at the time. We just went to a, there was a voter registration rally. It was an election year, and we were supporting a candidate who was, whose basic platform was to bring peace to Vietnam. His name was George McGovern, you might remember him. He became a friend of this church, was here three different times. We used to send him a birthday card in July when it was his birthday, we'd all sign it. Well, we went to the rally and there was a problem. Um, our friend Jeff Parker, who sometimes watches these services up in Burlington, Vermont on his computer, was running the campaign. That's where we met he and Michelle, who were great friends of ours. And uh, the main attraction, and there was a big crowd down on the common in Meadville, which we used to call the Oval, but it was the same as a common in New England. Um, they were there to see Mama Cass Elliott, the mamas and the papas. And as she was coming, she was doing a voter registration rally for this peace campaign uh, of George McGovern's. But she was late, late getting there because people took things pretty seriously in those days too. There was a threats on her life in Erie Pennsylvania, which was about an hour north of Meadville, where she had been speaking. So she was delayed, and people were starting to leave. So uh, our friend Jeff looks around. He says, we need somebody that can talk to stop people from leaving. Woody, why don't you get up there and talk? Well, uh, I was then egged on by the assistant minister at the Methodist Church. He and I were friends. And he said, yeah, go on. I, I urge you to get up there. I dare you to say, I want to make one thing perfectly clear, which was a Nixon line. So I said, well, okay. So I got up there, and the first thing I said was, I'd like to make one thing perfectly clear. I'm speaking for myself, not for my church. And then I proceeded to talk about peace in Vietnam and why George McGovern was standing for that, etc. cetera. Um, um, the, the newspaper, we had a daily paper in Meville. It didn't put that part of my uh, speech uh, in the uh, paper the next day. And the senior minister, uh, Bill Smith, that was a wonderful guy, he didn't take kindly to this because this could cause tr dissension in the church. I mean, the controversy over the war in Vietnam was quite severe. Uh, but he didn't fire me. Now, I can guarantee you, and I was kind of disappointed that this didn't take place, that when Mama Cass Elliott came, um, I can guarantee you, if I had gotten to sing with her, which was my hope, that I definitely would have been fired. So, anybody that's heard me sing knows that would be the case. Uh, I've always been Christian, ever, ever since, even when I was a kid, I grew up as a Christian. Um, um, and war has never made any sense to me. If you read the teachings of Jesus, if you read the vision of Isaiah, the teachings of the prophets, you wonder, what? How can we be supportive uh, and conduct wars. And there's a lot of wars in the Old Testament. There's no question about that. Um, and there were soldiers in Jerusalem. I mean, the Romans occupied Jerusalem, the mightiest army in the world at that time. So war was gory and very personal in those days. I mean, there were no planes flying overhead with bombs. There were no missiles being shot. It was sword to sword in the trenches. Modern war is even worse. It's not maybe as gory in terms of two people standing next to each other trying to hack each other's arms off or heads off. Um, but modern war very silently kills incredible numbers of people. I mean, from high above. 
and the weaponry is amazing. Many, many, many folks who are civilians are being killed in the Ukraine. Um, that's a great example of this. So we stop and we think, well, what can we do? The insert in today's bulletin encourages us to stand in the gap as followers of the Prince of Peace. Now, what does that mean? It, it just means gap to give, give financially to help uh, the thousands upon thousands of folks that are trying to leave uh, the Ukraine, to act. Now, what can we do? That's the question, right? What can we do? Well, one thing we can do is we can urge our elected leaders to work for peace, to use the resources of our government to try to bring about peace. So we can take some action. And then we can pray. And there's always the importance of prayer. Pray for peace. Now, this question of what we can do is actually what I was going to talk about, not in relate, uh, when I picked this topic a couple of weeks ago, not in relationship to the um, to war in the Ukraine, which hadn't started, I guess, when I managed to make a schedule of some topics we might cover during Lent. Uh, but the parable of the talents came to mind because last Saturday, uh, not yesterday, but a week ago, I did a, I, did, I didn't do, I kind of hosted a very unusual service of remembrance for a wonderful lady who was a member of this church, a Kathy Clark, who passed away. And her family, Ellen, her sister, some nieces and nephews, and her, uh, her brother uh, was also there. Uh, and uh, we, we, they were doing a service around the dining room table. They wanted to do a service for the caregivers because Kathy had been able to stay in that house up there in Bradford Lane um, for many years uh, after she kind of couldn't live independently anymore, but she did live independently. Uh, cared for by people. And so I read a couple of scripture readings and said a few words, and then everybody had a chance to share their memories of Kathy. It was really, uh, and these were caregivers. And they were very uh, unanimously sad and also inspired um, by the remembrances of Kathy. Um, and the scripture I had chosen, uh, one of them, was the parable of the talents, which you don't usually read at a funeral service. And it's, it's always bothered me, that story. It seems like, well, if the master of the manor is a representation of God, he gave some people all kinds of things, and they, they went and invested the money, the talents, although talent is another word. Uh, it doesn't have to be money if you just think of it as talents. But and they got more. They brought more. The fellow with five talents or $5,000 went and brought another $5,000 um, earned while the master was away. The fellow with the two talents or $2,000, if you want to look at the parable that way, invested it and brought another 2000 So he gave 4000 back to the master, the 2000 they started, and another 2000 And then this poor soul that only got 1000 was scared. He was scared to death, that person. He knew this master was, you know, pretty powerful, and he didn't want to lose the money. And he didn't have the self-confidence to proceed and invest it, so he dug, it, dug a hole in the ground. He didn't steal a thing, put it in the ground. When the master came back, he could give back to him what he had given him. And the master, it always seemed to me, got angry with this fellow. And I, well, that's what the story says, and I kept, I grappled with that. Why would... God be angry with somebody who had very little to start with and tried to save it out of fear uh, of the master or of God. And why would he be so angry with him? And then, it, at least this is my take on this. It's because the fellow did not, first of all, trust the master, and secondly, try. The person didn't do what he could, and he couldn't do as much as the other. He couldn't have made probably 10,000 uh, to turn back in, uh, but if he had made 1,000 plus another 1,000, that would have been good. But you know what? Now, this is simply my interpretation of this. You could interpret this other ways, but I think 
um, if he had lost the money, suppose he went and uh, somebody called him on the phone, as they do these days, and say, listen, we have an investment opportunity for you, some scammer, and the money was gone. Um, would the master still have been so mad? I don't think so. I think the problem here is that the person didn't try. He didn't take the talent he had and try. And I use this talking about Kathy Clark because she did. She was disabled. Uh, she had some severe uh, disabilities from birth. And yet she was a great example of what you can do uh, with what uh, talents or abilities or gifts you have. She lived independently for many years, which was quite an accomplishment. She had jobs. Her favorite one was working at, the, at Concord High School. Um, and then uh, her family, they deserve a lot of credit. They made it possible for her to continue to live at home after her, um, she came back home and, and lived with her mom, Rhoda, who uh, lived to be, she was 100, wasn't she? Or, yes. and, uh, and then her brother, Benny, was always there. Um, Zandy, her other brother, would come frequently, as he still does. Um, and the family took the resources they had, and they got caregivers there. And Kathy was a joy to these caregivers. She was as independent as she could be. Uh, she was kind and warm to all she met. Uh, she had a wonderful sense of humor. Um, she did have a sense of suffering sometimes because she was a Boston sports fan. <laughs> but she, uh, she was a loving, hopeful, joy-filled person. So she gave back the talent. She used the talent she had which under most definitions would be pretty limited. And she lived a life that brought joy and warmth and happiness and kindness to other people. That's pretty amazing. So I think her life reminded me that all of us have something we can do. Um, we, can't, we can't call Boris Putin on the phone. Is that his first name, Boris? Whatever his name is. What's his, is that right? Oh, Vladimir. Good thing I don't call him. I'd really get him angry. Uh, Vladimir Putin. We can't call Vladimir and, and ask him to get the heck out of the Ukraine and stop this carnage. But there are some things we can do. We can give money. Uh, that's important to help these refugees. There are all kinds of different organizations, including the one uh, that I put the insert in the bulletin from the Presbyterian Disaster Fund. Uh, all kinds of organizations that are working to try to help uh, the refugees. We can act. Uh, we can contact our elected leaders and urge them to help the people suffering in the Ukraine because they've got a lot of resources that could be used for this kind of thing and urge them uh, and our president to try to work out a diplomatic solution ending the war. Can you imagine uh, Vladimir and now that I can remember his first name, I should just call him Vlad. Vlad threatens to use nuclear weapons. What kind of human being would even consider such a thing? When they dropped the nuclear weapon, and we did it, uh, in Hiroshima, people were gone like that. There was nothing left. They were shadows. That's not what God wants. God wants peaceful solutions to problems. Now, that's... Easier said than done, but it's important to try. And then we can pray, and we pray to a God who is a God of peace, a God of mercy, a God of justice, a God of compassion, that he help us do what we can do and help our leaders do what they can do um, to bring peace to a part of the world, that uh, Europe, that has known war. In the past century, uh, in the 20th century, two world wars uh, in Europe. There's no need for a third one. So we do what we can as disciples of the Prince of Peace. You know, there was a Unitarian minister named uh, Forrest Church. Had a big church in New York City. His father, Frank Church, was a United States senator back in the days of Vietnam and, and some years after that, I think. Uh, and he had three rules of life that he had um, posted on his wall. First one is do what you can. And that's what I think those of us who are just regular folks 
can try to do. Um, want what you have and be who you are are the other two parts of that. So at this moment in history, or may we all do what we can to help the people of the Ukraine and with God's help, and that's what we pray for, um, do what acts we can to end the senseless violence of humans killing human beings uh, over boundary lines or over uh, despotic wishes for power or whatever drives people uh, to do uh, the things they do in war. So let us uh, prepare for the Lord's Supper, which is about a man who gave his life so that we all might be forgiven of our sins and we all might work for peace. And uh, the prayer I'll give at the end of communion is written by the Presbyterian Disaster Fund um, director. So let us um, sing our second hymn, which is number 463. not the Presbyterian Church table, the Community Church table, the United States Church table, it is the Lord's table, and all are invited to partake in his meal. And let us bow together in prayer. Gracious God, we ask your blessing upon these elements that they might remind us of the depth of your love for all of humankind and of your offer to forgive our sins and help us to try again to do better. We confess many times that we have contributed to division rather than unity. We have contributed to aggression rather than a peaceful solution in our personal lives and in our lives as citizens of this country and of this world. Inspire us to do better, we ask. Forgive us our shortcomings, Lord. Forgive the times when we could have done something to be helpful and were too afraid. As the servant in that parable that we read this morning. Be with us as we celebrate this meal, which grants us forgiveness and newness of life. We ask a blessing upon these elements, that they be blessed uh, and be symbols of your great love for all of humankind and your forgiveness for our many sins, both uh, sins we have committed and sins when we have left good things undone. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. The night in which he was betrayed, after having supper with his disciples, Jesus took bread and broke it, 
and gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup, he said this cup represents my blood which is shed for all of you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you eat this bread and drink of this cup, you do show forth my death until I come again. And let us share together in the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, take and eat, this is my body broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. Jesus took the cup and said, take and drink, do this in remembrance of me. Let us bow together in prayer. 
God of mercy, justice, and peace. Our spirits are heavy with sorrow, our souls shocked at the sudden and breathtaking violence, the invasion of Ukraine by their neighbor Russia. We pray for lives caught up in the grip of war, for those who hear the bombs in the night, the ominous movement of troops on the road into town, the whistle of incoming shells, the cry from a desperate neighbor or a shout of warning, for those who huddle in subways and basements or flee for the borders clutching their children's hands. We pray for families separated from fathers, brothers, and sons who have remained to fight and protect their homeland. We pray for neighbors in Eastern and Central Europe as their hearts and doors open to these refugees. We pray that strained resources will become an abundance of hope that fears and struggles with racism will yield to a generosity or profound welcome, that communities of faith within the Ukraine will be protected from harm and sustained in their efforts to feed and shelter their neighbors, that peacemakers and protesters in Russia will be heard and their lives preserved. May we undergird our prayers with tangible resources to help. May we reach deeply give generously and welcome extravagantly. May we lift our voices in a strong and unified advocacy. May we all, even as we breathe in lament, breathe out mercy, hope, and peace. And in this Lenten season, when we walk the way toward death and resurrection, repent our complicities in cultures of violence and renew our efforts toward justice and peace. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray together and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus, we just want to thank you. Jesus, we just want to thank you. Jesus, we just Let's continue to worship as we share our morning gifts. Thank you. 
God, we ask your blessing upon these our gifts and upon us. May we be your disciples and do what we can to be peacemakers. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And our closing hymn is number 677. forth into the world in peace, be of good courage, render to no one evil for evil, support the weak and help the afflicted, and work for peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>